Welcome to Monochemistry. Today we're going to take an introductory look into chemical kinetics. We'll start by having a brief discussion about what kinetics is. In general, the, the term kinetics, as you're probably already aware, refers to movement or motion, as in the, the kinetic molecular theory of atoms. More specifically, chemical kinetics is specifically related to reaction rates of chemicals. In other words, how quickly do, th do things react to form products? In terms of measuring, generally we measure that in concentration concentration of something divided by time in seconds. Now what is a reaction rate? A reaction rate is the change in the concentration of a reactant or product over time. How do you measure reaction rates? Well quite simply you can you can either you, you can either measure the amount the rate at which the reactant disappears or the rate at which the product appears. And depending on what reactants and products you have, you're going to choose one or the other. Let me show you an example. All right, so here's an example uh, that's one that's actually in your textbook on page 559 of how we might be able to see a change in concentration. It, it's not how we measure it, but we could see it. So in this particular circumstance, this is aqueous bromine, and it's reacting with a chemical called formic acid, which has the chemical formula of this. Sorry. Okay, so bromine is reacting with that, and over time, Br2 is turning into Br minus. Note that during that time, there's a color change. Okay? So from here, we would have a known concentration, and over here, we would know that the concentration of this would be zero, so we could measure that. And of course, we could time how long it took to do that. And once we had those two values, we can then calculate how quickly the reaction happened. Okay, so that's basically what ki kinetics is. Unfortunately, it's not always as, just as simple as that. And we're going to look at some of those in just a second. Calculating reaction rates. So for the, for the last little example that we talked about, there was the concentration of bromine, which I should actually fix because it should be Br2. Sorry about that. And we would have noticed that the concentration of bromine decreased over time. Agreed? Notice that's a straight line. If I was trying to calculate the slope of that line, which is how the concentration of Br2 changes over time, I would come up with the rate. Okay? In other words, the change in the concentration of the bromine divided by the change in time would give me the rate. And of course that would be an average rate. Okay, so that would be perfect. If, if everything was just nice and linear like that, that everything worked out nicely, it would be perfect. You could calculate that. It wouldn't be hard at all. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work that way. What this shows is this shows a constant rate because it's a straight line. It's decreasing at constant. has a constant value, which means that the reaction itself is not dependent on the concentration of bromine. It's going to happen at the same rate no matter what. That's not always how it works, though. Let's have a look at that. We're going to look at the differences between instantaneous versus average speed. We just look at average rate, right? We had a linear relationship between the bromine and time, and that was all fine and dandy. We calculated using the slope of the line. Well, look at these lines here. You can't calculate the slope of these lines. So what we need to do is we need to calculate instantaneous velocities, or instantaneous rates. Sorry, not velocities. Instantaneous speeds or in this case rates. Notice that how quickly the, t the amount of the concentration of NO2, how quickly it decreases, changes over time. 
It's not a straight line. At first, it decreases very rapidly, then it starts to taper off. Okay, so NO2 would be our reactant. The speed at which the reaction happens is dependent on the concentration of the reactants. Notice also that the products form very quickly at first, which makes sense because this is decreasing very quickly at first, and then they start to taper off. Okay, so the rate of a reaction, this is very important, is dependent on the concentration of the reactant or, in some cases, the product, depending on which way you're looking at it. Because remember, you can measure either or. It doesn't have to be the products or the reactants. It can be one or the other. And that's just following along from your textbook as well. It doesn't matter which one you measure. It just has to be one of them. Let's look a little bit at what this means. Unfortunately, not every relationship, as we talked about before, is a linear relationship, and therefore it's very sometimes very difficult to calculate the slope. However, we can come up with a relationship between these two things. In other words, we can come up with a relationship between rate and concentration if we use what is called the proportionality. And they are proportional. As one does something, the other one does something. It's directly proportional. We talked about the, that term in, in, in when we did gas laws. So in this case, the rate is proportional to the concentration of, in this case, we'll use the NO2. Just makes it simple. Keep it simple. Okay? Um, and then what we do with that, because this is not technically a mathematical equation, what we do with that is we say rate is then equal to some constant K, in this case, the rate constant, uh, multiplied by the concentration of NO2. Okay? What that tells me is if I know the rate constant and I know the concentration of NO2, then I can calculate the rate. However, another way to look at it is this. The constant would be equal to the concentration of NO2. Sorry. Got that backwards. My algebra skills. It would be equal to the rate divided by the concentration of NO2. Okay? Uh, now, it's important to note that the constant itself is not dependent on the concentration of the reactant or product as long as the temperature remains the same. Okay, if the temperature changes, let me just see that there, temperature is, should say, constant. Okay, so that's true as long as temperature is constant. Apparently, I can't spell either. So algebra and spelling. Apparently, I shouldn't be a chemistry teacher at all. All right, anyway. That's how you would that's how you would rearrange this to, to make it look and, and and that's how you get the, the constant. If you know the rate and the concentration of the nitrogen dioxide, you can calculate the K. Now you might be wondering why people would want to know this. Reaction rates are very important. Here's why. If I'm a if I'm a scientist and I have a particular reaction that I'm working with, let's say in an industry like agriculture and I know a reaction takes a particular amount of time. Time, just like in every other industry, is money. If I can figure out ways to make that reaction happen more efficiently, happen quicker, then I can save companies a great deal of money and that will, in turn, probably make me very rich. But besides that, figuring out how quickly reactions happen helps us also figure out how they happen and helps us get an idea of what is actually going on on a molecular level. And that is very important, right? So forget about, you know, you look at the NO2 plus whatever yields, yada, yada, yada. You want to find out what's going on on the molecular level. Each individual molecule, what are they doing? You understand more about kinetics. You understand more about that. That in a nutshell, folks, is your intro to chemical kinetics.